Some time ago I found this. An old 16 years old Range Rover with 447,000 kilometers for only 3,100 euros. I just couldn't believe my eyes, so I went to see it. And I bought it, as you can see. I bought the cheapest left-hand drive Range Rover in the European Union. And most probably also the highest mileage Range Rover with this engine and gearbox combination. Which is, by the way, generally speaking, the worst engine and gearbox combination which you can choose in these cars. I managed to negotiate the price a little, so I bought it for 2,850 euros, which is still not bad for a drivable, kind of drivable Range Rover. We all know that these cars do have a reputation for being unreliable, plus they are also expensive to fix. So finding one which still works and which has more than 440,000 kilometers is a little miracle. Of course, I know that it will break sooner or later, it has to, but when exactly, that's the real question. In this first video I will show you the exterior, the interior and some of the things which are not working, as well as some of the common issues. And in the second video I will show you the underside of the car, and I will take you for a test drive in this high mileage Range Rover. Unless it will break prematurely, because there are some issues with the gearbox. But first thing first, let's check out the exterior. If you look at the rear of the car, then you can immediately see three common problems, which affect these Range Rovers. The first is the rust on the upper part of the tailgate. The rust starts on both of the edges and if you won't fix it in time, then your tailgate will end up like mine. Ruined and rusted through, so in this case it's not worth to repair it, just to replace it completely. The next very obvious issue is the tail light condensation, which surprisingly is not going to get better over time. This is caused by the plastic cover which will develop smaller or bigger cracks, or the plastic cover slightly disconnects from the tail light housing, causing the water and later also the dirt to accumulate in the lower part of the light. This not only looks bad, but the water will get to the lower tail light bulbs as well, causing them to fail. And the last issue is with the rear wiper motor, which is in this case not working at all. The wiper arm should be hidden under this cover, but as you can see, in this case it just decided to stop in this strange position. Later I also discovered that the upper edge of the tailgate is damaged, but that's not really something which would concern me, and nobody sees that anyway. But let's move on to the paint of this car, which is pretty faded. On the other side it looks like it's still the original paint job from the factory. Of course, there are numerous scratches, dents and stone chips, but after all these years and numerous owners, I am not surprised at all. And since this car was regularly used on winter salty roads, it has a couple of places which are rusty as well. However, there is no rust on the side doors, on the front fenders and on the hood, simply because all of these parts are made from aluminium. On the other side, a common place which will rust on these cars are the rear wheel arches. So if I open the rear door, then you can clearly see that the rust is already where it is expected to be. The only good thing is that the rust on this side is still not bad. However, if you let it be, then you will end up with a much nicer, rusty piece of art, which I am very lucky to have on this other side of the car. And since I managed to improve the body ventilation in this area, it looks even better. This would not bother me that much if the jacking point on this side would not be ruined as well. But such is life, nothing lasts forever. The front of the car looks much better than the rear, but of course the bumper has seen better days. One of the fog lights is cracked, as you can see. The other fog light has either road salt or some sand in it, 
that's a nice design feature by the way. And lastly, there is a dead bug in one of the headlights. Poor guy. And that's all for the body condition basically. Let me know in the comments what you think. Is it still in an acceptable condition or is it completely junk which deserves to be scrapped? In the meantime, let's move on to the interior. After stepping inside you can immediately notice three things. The steering wheel leather is more worn, the seat side plastic cover is completely ruined, and the center of the door panel is a little worn too. As you can see, the door panel itself doesn't look that bad, except the center part, which is, well, not new anymore. But other than this, it's still okay, considering the mileage. The seat side plastic cover is on the other side completely destroyed and as you can see I got the bigger piece inside the trunk. This is a common problem on these before facelift Range Rovers, but usually you can't find this piece ruined completely, like here. However, the seat itself is in a very impressive condition after 440,000 km and only the side of the seat leather is cracked a little. Plus, all the electrical adjustments still work on the driver as well as on the passenger seat. Unlike the leather seats, the leather on the steering wheel is a lot more worn. After I cleaned the leather on it, it revealed its matte, worn condition, so it almost looks like an Alcantara steering wheel. But it's clean at least. If you look closely, then you can see that this Range Rover has the optional heated steering wheel, which is a great feature in the winter. But in this case the heating is not working at all. It also has the electrically adjustable steering column, which was standard, and it also standardly likes to break on these cars. But in this case it's surprisingly working without any issues. Interestingly, all the buttons in the interior look like new, so there is no problem with them. However, after turning on the ignition, another common problem starts to be clearly visible and it's the well-known problem with the dead pixels on the instrument cluster. In this case, not only the actual mileage will be hard to see, but also all the warning messages on the wide screen below. On the other side, some of the pixels can come back for a moment, but this is just a temporary situation. And since the electronics of this early Range Rover is shared with the BMW 5 Series E39, the BMW 7 Series E38 and the first X5, these cars can have the same dead pixel issue. The ancient multimedia system is also shared with the 5 series or with the first X5, but this also means that it's hopelessly outdated and it's useless in today's world. Although it has one interesting feature, which was, I think, ahead of its time. Wow! Obviously the cassette tape player was not impressive back then, but the folding feature was definitely something special back in 2003. The AC panel is pretty straightforward and very easy to use, however my AC is not working at all and the blower motor is dead as well. So the car is basically ready for summer. Below the AC panel is an interesting clock and the air suspension control button, but I will come back to the air suspension a little later. Under the shifter is the hill descent control button and the low range button. The hill descent control works, but the low range feature sometimes works and sometimes it gets stuck. Under the big center armrest there is a regular storage area. And directly under the armrest is the wireless car phone, which is not working, obviously. I also found the genuine Land Rover SIM card holder, in which you put your SIM card and then you can put it inside the phone bracket. And then you can call your butler. Next, all the power windows work, except the front passenger window, which is really slow when opening and mainly when closing. 
Later, I also discovered that the rear right door lock simply doesn't want to unlock from the outside, just from the inside. And that would be the interior. Let's quickly check out the engine. It really looks like that the engine is in a good condition, at least for now. It starts immediately when warmed up and when cold as well, the idle is smooth, plus it's not smoking during acceleration, so I'm pretty satisfied with it. It is a well-known 3-liter BMW M57 straight 6-cylinder common rail diesel engine, which has 177 horsepower and 390 Nm of torque. These numbers are ok for a regular 5 series BMW E39, but not really for a big and heavy Range Rover. However, the good thing about this weakest engine is that it doesn't have a DPF and it has only one turbocharger, so it is fairly simple compared to the today's diesel engines. Plus, with the proper maintenance it can reach 500,000 km or 600,000 km. All in all, apart from the disconnected wiring which is just hanging there, everything is as it should be, at least in the engine compartment. If we move on to the wheels, then you can see that they are worn according to the age and the mileage, so nothing really to see here. On the other side, the tires are still in a very good condition and they are from 2015, so they are not even that old. The brake rotors are not very worn either, although they have a significant amount of rust on them, which indicates that the car was sitting for a long time. Which should be true, because according to the oil change sticker in the engine compartment, it has done only 7000 km in 3 years, which is not a lot. Well, maybe the previous owner was too scared to drive it, I guess. And last but not least, let's check out the air suspension, which is another common problem of these cars. Most of the time either the air compressor fails, which is located under the spare wheel, or one of the air struts starts to leak. In my case, it seems like the air struts are not leaking, and actually, both of the front struts were replaced in 2015, according to the stickers on them. However, when I turn the button to raise or lower the car, then in a lot of cases it does nothing. The light, which indicates that the suspension is raising or lowering, starts to flash and that's it. Nothing more, nothing less. But after I start to drive, it usually somehow fixes itself. I don't know what to think about this, but maybe the air compressor is on its way out. Who knows. On the other side, even the standard right height is good enough, so I don't need to play with the right height anyway. If you don't bother it, it won't break, I guess. And that's basically it. Now you have seen the exterior, the interior, the engine, and some of the details of this high mileage Range Rover. If you want to see how this thing looks like underneath, how it drives, and how badly is the gearbox broken, then stay tuned for the second part of this video. And as usual, thanks for watching.